I bring you greetings from the great nation of South Africa and our incredible cricket team. But I just felt today, and I want to share something to you that I really hold absolutely dear. Often when we speak, and my life now in politics, I get to interact with a lot of church leaders and churches from a different role. And I can recall when I was involved in church a number of years ago, I used to say to everybody, come to church just as you are. And look, I don't not believe that. Of course, you got to come just as you are. And often people would come just as they are and never bring anything. But I found that the longer I've been involved and now trying to speak and lead in South Africa, because leadership isn't always about position, it's about influence. And God places people in nations not so that they can occupy positions because God has never raised leaders through votes. God has never raised leaders through money. God has always raised leaders through what he imparts over their lives so that they can carry something in that nation. Don't come. So now I find you could come to conference empty handed. And perhaps maybe others might argue the case that's the best way to come because you're ready to receive. I want to speak to those people today who come and they say, I have brought something and I want to put it at the altar today. So the title of today is, what do you carry? Is the question. And I wanted to speak to you from John chapter 2, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Yeah. John chapter 2 is a story about a wedding that takes place in Cana. Now, I love the story because often when we speak about it, people describe it as the first miracle that Jesus did. And I love the story because Jesus shows up. Now, I, I want to tell you the story because I, I really like it. Firstly, I suspect there was an invitation to Mary to say, would you come to the wedding? And Jesus shows up with his disciples in the story. Now the reason I love this story is because I think, and you might be sensitive about this, but I genuinely think that the disciples at least were black people. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because when Natalie and I got married at our wedding, we had people we didn't know come to the wedding. Because as black people, especially Africans, we love a good party. So I'm telling you today, my black self go have himself a good time. And we love a good party, and it doesn't matter. I promise you, black people, we go to good parties, it doesn't matter. Whether it's a wedding or a funeral, we'll be there. And the only difference between a wedding and a funeral is that there's just one person less. Other than that, we are there. So here's what's cool, right? So like I suspect that there was an invitation for one. Mary, would you come to the wedding? Mary invites Jesus. Jesus shows up with disciples. Like for those of you who do guest lists and you put them together in tables, this just messes with table settings because Jesus cruises in with a posse. A few people show up at the wedding, guests that were unexpected, and they arrive at this wedding. I love it because think about from this couple's point of view, they're like, oh my goodness, we didn't expect so many guests. Suddenly they've showed up. We know that there was probably an oversupply of guests because halfway through, they run out of wine. And as all of this happens, the, the, the couple, they go up to, oh, Mary, listen, we've ran out of wine. Would you do something? I don't know what they expected Mary to do. Jesus, Mary goes up to the disciples. She says words that I think you should hold on to. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And then, here's the thing that I find pretty cool. Is that Jesus then speaks to the disciples. He says to them, um, honorable members, would you please grab those water pots, go fill them with water? No jokes. Me, I would be like, wow. 
like no jokes. I don't know why. These people are asking for wine. You are telling us to fill it with water. You and I have read the story backwards, so we know the miracle. But just imagine for just with me for one second, if you are a disciple and God said to you, just, just go get water and bring it. There are a few people I want to talk about in this story. The first is the average wedding guest. You know the story. Jesus then, you know, they turn water into wine. And then ultimately the guests have the greatest party of their lives. In fact, even the master of the, of, of, of the whole place says, listen, most people give out the cheap wine up front. And then they say, they, they give the best wine and then they leave the cheap one at the end. But you have given us the best at the end. But here's why I love this story, because the story can be seen from multiple angles. Let me speak to the first group of people that were at the wedding. Perhaps those are people who are guests at the wedding. They showed up, they enjoyed the wedding. They had a good time. For them, the wedding had been going on for a few days. And so when they got more wine, and don't hear me encouraging people to drink, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying they walked away and they had a great time. And so maybe four days later, five days later, they would have been talking to their neighbors and saying, do you remember that wedding? Do you remember how cool that wedding was? We had good wine, but in truth, that wine will run out of their systems. They'll quickly forget about it and move on to with their lives to the next wedding. Here's the problem is that I've found people like you. I've come to enough conferences. I've come to enough places to know that we can have a good time here and we can walk away and go home. And when we get home, all of that in a few days can run out. So I don't want to just be a guest at conference. It's great. We can be blessed at conference, but I don't want to just be a guest. I want to be a planet shaker. I want to be a miracle worker. And so I'm going to move away from just being a guest to being a bucket carrier. The next group of people in the story are the disciples. Oh, I love those guys. Because here they are, they get told, listen, just go get some water. Now imagine the story of the disciples. If you read John chapter 1, Jesus met them and they come up to him and they say, we think we've met the Messiah. If you just read John, many of them hadn't seen a single miracle yet. And sometimes people follow Jesus just simply because they think, well, I've seen a miracle. I've seen Jesus do great things, so I'm going to follow Jesus. For them, it was just at a word. And you know, when I walked into politics, I was involved. I had a thriving, we were in church, we were doing well. Natalie had married a pastor. It was quite easy. But at God's word, he said to me, I want you to move away from where you are. I was speaking at a church, and I felt a young person was disobeying their call to politics. And when I nobody responded, I got in the car, and Natalie said to me, I think you are that young person. And at that point, I knew nothing about economics. I knew nothing about governance. All I knew, I just finished a master's in theology. But you know what? For some of you who are here, you need to remind yourself of this. That God doesn't, you know, God sometimes doesn't, you got to wait for miracles. i got to wait for confirmation. But if you want to be a planet shaker, because leadership is a lonely journey, there are times where you got to say, at your word, one word. I heard, I saw the Messiah. He said, I must come into politics and I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow you at your word. When God spoke to me about South Africa, I didn't know too much. I literally the following day went and registered for a course in public administration. I did economics as a discipline. I was not the most qualified. All I knew, it was a word. All I knew was a word. And for those disciples, if you read in John chapter 1, all they had was just a word. The miracle was only coming the following day. And I want to promise you, I can recall when I got called into a leadership position. I, I'm a child of a cashier. My mother was a cashier and unemployed for most of our, my upbringing as a child. My father just worked in a lock factory business. And in truth... I didn't know a lot of money. I didn't know about money at all. In fact, the only pocket money we'd get was when my grandmother gave us money so that we could go to church and put it in the offering. And I would just tithe on like one rand and just be like, I'll keep the rest. So money 
we didn't have. And so when God called me into politics, I knew that our elections in South Africa were going to cost us hundreds and hundreds of millions of rands. And I didn't know how I was going to get that. In fact, I can remember going to God one night. I said, God, I don't know how I'm going to get hundreds and hundreds of millions of rands. I'm a black child from Soweto. I know very little. And I want to tell you something that's incredibly awesome. At your word, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Grab my bucket, walk to Jesus, say, listen, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm bringing water to you. Would you turn? And I have seen God provide in the most incredible ways, even for last election. And you know, now I can trust him for the next elections because I know he is a God that turns water into wine. So long as you're willing to carry something before him. So now here's the thing. Imagine, like seriously, like God, like I'm like, wow. Grabs, says to them, take the bucket. Off you go. Fill it with water. Not the most qualified, not the most educated, not the most resourced. And they show up. And I've begun thinking, what did they carry that day? Was it just water? What, what did they carry? And I want to just share with you three things that I believe if you want to be a planet shaker, you need to carry. And I've seen this in politics. I've seen it in the area that God has called me to. You got to carry some things. Never show up empty handed. Like it's amazing. When we need healing, we bring sick people. When we need financial provision, we bring our finances. How is it that when we need God to do something in our nations, we never carry our nations into conference and say, God, I'm going to bring South Africa. I'm going to bring my city. I'm going to bring Melbourne. I'm going to bring whatever. I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring it because I'm carrying something. So number one, number one, you have to carry a conviction. You have to carry a conviction. Your convictions are birthed out of a place you spend with God. It's that word. And you carry a conviction. You carry something in your heart that says, it ain't right. In South Africa, 9 million people are unemployed. Our inequality levels is the highest in the world. Our education system isn't the best in comparison to what other African states are spending. That's not a conviction. That's what I see in the natural. But here's my conviction. The best wine is still to come. We may have started with water. We may have started even with a cheap wine. But I know I serve a God who is able to turn economies around. I serve a God who is able to turn cities around. And therefore, if he's able, I'm going to just bring my water and be like, here's the education water. Here's the healthcare water. Here's the, here's the inequality water. God, would you turn water into wine for the best is yet to come and therefore for our nation for our society south africa is a nation that comes out of apartheid a division of races yet god through his mighty work brought about a change in that nation i believe our gift to the world will be a reconciled society a race that sees that races can work together and i think the best wine is still coming to carry a conviction because it gets ugly it gets ugly you can ask any church leader here today I used to be criticized in church the worst criticism I'd get people would walk up to me at the end of a sermon and I'll never forget this you know well meaning they'd say like that, that wasn't that wasn't too bad and I'd respond by saying wow I poured my life but I have seen articles written about me in newspapers. I sometimes sit in parliament and people say some of the most frightening things. You know what sometimes, you know how the opposition tries to attack me? They show up with a Bible and they open it and they start reading scriptures about false prophets and all of that. Seriously, in our parliament, they do that. 
And I remember when I speak to other political leaders, they say, oh, well, you got to have a thick skin because they're going to come thick and fast at you. But you know, you need to have all of that. You need to be able to allow some things to fall off you. You need to have all of, all of that. But you know, when you have a conviction, you say to yourself, what a small price to pay if you're going to come after me because I have a conviction that a nation is at stake and I'm never going to shy away from that. You could criticize me. You could criticize the Bible. You could say mean things to me. But I'm telling you now, I have a conviction that says God has not forgotten South Africa. I'm going to hold on to it. What's your conviction? Man, there have been tough times. You know, in politics, they teach you one simple rule. They say your opponents, if you think about a typical parliament, they say your opponents sit opposite you and your enemies sit behind you. Which are your people. Because people will stab you in the back and all of that. I'll never forget the first time, man, somebody did that to me. I was so hurt. And I thought, I'm going to be the big politician. I'm going to show them. Because, you know, don't mess with me. And I'll never forget, God said to me, why don't you forgive them? Because that's what's in the Bible. I don't hear anywhere where I said I must settle scores and do all of that. I'll just forgive them. I was like, that's not right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but you know, sometimes, even when people have written the most mean things about me, I hold on to the simple truth. I have a conviction. What kept Nelson Mandela in jail and kept him going for 27 years in prison wasn't that he enjoyed prison food. It wasn't that he kind of like thought it was simply this. He had a conviction that what he was in there for, he would see to pass in a nation. And you've got to hold on to that. That's what leaders who change the world do. That's what planet shakers, they have a deep conviction that says it doesn't matter. I'm going to see a nation get changed. I'm going to see a nation get changed. The second thing that I believe you've got to carry is you've got to have a revelation of Christ that confronts culture. So, because the natural thing is to swim in the culture. The natural thing is to look around what's happening and study models and say to yourself, oh, well, this model works for that and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And there are business people here, there are church leaders here, there are politicians here, there are healthcare workers here. But I want to say this, if you are willing to change the world, there is something that you're going to have to step aside and say, well, actually my Christology, my revelation of Christ doesn't just limit me to doing what I've always done for walking with what I've always walked. I am going to adopt a Christology that confronts culture. One of my greatest fear about the church, if I could say this, is that often people convert to the culture of Christianity. They don't actually get a revelation of Christ that says to them, it does not matter. I have a revelation and I'm going to carry that. Just imagine Mary's audacity. Whatever he says to do, just do it. It must have been so countercultural. I'm, I'm sure there were days where you were just walking around with a bucket there are days where you look at the water and it's still water. There are days you're just walking around and be like, mm -mm -mm. wow. Like you're walking around, people looking at you. Why are you carrying that stuff, man? Why are you involved in politics? Why, why are you doing all of that? The culture of the day says, if it's not instant, it's not working. Put your bucket down. It's not instant, right? We have instant faith, instant miracle. We have instant everything, instant coffee, instant microwaves. We've got instant everything. And truth is, if you want to see a nation turn, it never is instant because we've got to have a vision that goes generation to generation. What I sow today, I'll never see in my life, but I believe I've got to sow some things into South Africa that I will see for generations to come. It's not instant. 
you've got to have a conviction. You've got to have a Christ-like culture that confronts societal culture. Third thing I want to tell you. I went to a funeral. And I really like funerals. Not all the time. But this time I was invited to be a pole bearer. You know what a pole bearer is? Anyone ever been a pole bearer? Not a nice job. Really not a nice job. So, but I don't know how I get, I got the honor of being the pole bearer. So I got it. And this guy who was, who was there was a distant cousin. But he wasn't a small guy. He probably was like my size, whatever that is in your eyes. If you've ever been a poor bearer, it is one of the heaviest things you can carry. I am not messing with you. Some of you have never done this. It is heavy going. So I'm there, like literally like holding on. And like we were at this church that had like a long exit. So we're walking, right? Like I can see everybody's getting tired. Like you start sweating, your knuckles are turning white. I'm not making this up. One guy from the other side says, guys, I can't do this anymore. No jokes. He says, can we put it down like this side, swap, and pick it up on this side, because then I can balance myself out. And no jokes, they do it, right? I kept thinking to myself, what? I was like, wow. <laughs> so we cruise along, put it in the hearse, go off to the gravesite, funeral is done. The only thing I can remember about that funeral wasn't just that experience, is that it was potato salad. Like every funeral has potato salad. That's all I remember. Preacher last night spoke about, I want to speak about just pregnancy, which is an area I have huge expertise in. My wife was pregnant in the heat of December with our first child. She, in a different way, was also carrying a person. Just like I was carrying as a poor bearer, she was also carrying a person who grew. It was hot. It was uncomfortable. And I kept thinking, I wonder which of the two are you? Are you the person that's going to carry dead things, carry bitterness, carry anger, carry hopelessness, carry defeat, carry? Because that is tiring, and you're not looking forward to it except the potato salad. But I wonder if you were pregnant with a vision for the nation, with a vision for your city, with your vision for your church, with your vision for your country, whether or not when you are carrying that, it grows inside of you. And even though you get tired, there is nothing in you that says you want to give up because you are not a poor bearer. You are a life giver. And so you're going to walk out and say, God, I'm going to carry this with everything inside of me, God. I'm going to carry it so I can see life in my nation, life in my school, life in my classroom. What are you carrying, friends? Don't just come as you are, carry something. Why don't you just remain standing? Why don't you just remain standing wherever you're at? Why don't you remain standing? Because in truth, what you carry will define you. What you carry will define you. Most people who have been pregnant, they look at the woman and go, you're glowing. And she, Natalie would complain at night. She'd be like, oh, I'm in pain. I'm in this. I was like, you're glowing. And sometimes it's going to be hard. I work in a field that sometimes is difficult. People want to stab at you. They want to do stuff. But I remind myself that maybe I'm glowing. Because I'm not carrying death. I'm not carrying. I'm carrying life. I'm carrying a nation. And the best wine is yet to come. The best wine is yet to come. I don't know about you, but you see, it's very tempting to believe that because Australia's incomes are high up, 
that there's no need to carry Australia. From God's perspective, money is just an object, but lives are everything. Can you carry people? What are you carrying? What are you carrying? And you know, and I can tell you this, I just got so much. So if you want to carry something, you got to carry something in the spirit. Because what you birth in the spirit, God will sustain. What you birth in the flesh, you have to sustain. So here's the thing, right? You got to bring your own bucket. And just in closing, I was just reading even about in 2 Kings chapter 4, it speaks about a certain woman who the man of God said, go find every jar in the city. Bring it. And when she brought every jar to the city, it says the oil kept flowing. All she had to do was carry something. I don't know about you. I don't know about where we are. But I really want to believe this. That we've got to carry something. We've got to carry a deep revelation. We've got to have convictions. We've got to have a Christology that transcends all of that. But we've got to birth it in the spirit. Nations are not one just by votes or in the flesh. They are one in the spirit. Do on earth what is happening in heaven, not the other way around. And so for the disciples that day, they, all they experienced is that they took their buckets, they filled them up with water, they went to God, they watched a miracle. I wonder what their attitude was a few months from then. It wasn't that now suddenly they had good wine and they could go away. Suddenly they thought, if God was able to turn water into wine, can, like it says in Luke chapter 4, open the eyes of the blind, set the captives free, declare the year of jubilee. I think in a world where we face fear, where we face crimes, there is an opportunity for us to see the captives free, to see nations set free, to see countries come to know God. I would love it if you reached into your pocket and said to yourself, I'm not coming empty-handed. I'm bringing something to God that I can see my nation come to know Christ. I can see countries be impacted. Bring something to God. And if you bring your water, all I know is that God will turn water into wine. May God richly bless you. And I pray your nations be impacted for what God will do through you. God bless you. And thank you very, very much. Real friends. Loving. Laughing. And learning together. Sharing stories, one life at a time. So grab a seat. Welcome to Joni Table Talk. Hello, everyone. All right, are we going to do a, a Joni Table Talk? This is a daily show that I do on Daystar. We have some amazing guests. Are you going to be a good audience for us? All right. Um, I'm so excited. Did you enjoy Musi today? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Wait, I, aren't you supposed to say, wow? <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> and how many of you know this guy right here, Sammy Rodriguez? He told me to be sure and tell you that he is the favorite guest on Joni Table Talk. He's been with me many times, so is that good? All right, I did it. Rachel Lamb, this is my daughter, Rachel. <laughs> and you all know Pastor Neil? <laughs> and also Speaker Theo Hardname. <laughs> Have you got your microphone there? Okay, so tell us the last name. How do we say it? Your last name. You say it Zuranor. How do you say it, Pastor Neil? Zuranor. Okay, good job. All I just right. made that up. Well, can one yes change the world? Take a look. One small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. One small step. Contact light. One small dream can lead us 
to greatness. The eagle has landed. One small push, one small idea can inspire us all. But one word can sway the masses. I have a dream today. One prejudice could disqualify us. Sometimes the weight to rise above in a broken world could feel like too much. Yet one small act, word. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Stand in the face of darkness. That is now is the road to freedom. The time to build is upon us. Have been known to transform the world. So we ask ourselves, what can I do? But for those who have gone before, change wasn't possible through their abilities, power, or qualifications but through their willingness to just say yes. We all have the choice. One small yes can change the course of history. All right. One small yes. All of the people sitting at the table today have said yes. Are you that are watching by television, those of you in the audience, are you willing to say yes to the one who created you? Let's start with you, Musi, and tell a little bit of your personal story growing up in South Africa because you were just an ordinary little boy, um, not really raised in wealth and splendor, an average family, and yet you serve an extraordinary God that took an ordinary boy and has done amazing things. Yeah, yeah, and thank you so much. Um, when I, 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 I was just saying earlier on, I, I grew up to two parents who were relatively poor. My parents weren't all that educated. We lived in, during the apartheid era where black people lived on one side and white people lived on another side. And so that, you were born during apartheid? Yeah, I, was, I, I lived most of my childhood uh, in the last latter parts of apartheid. And in fact, politics was just such a big part of society that we're living in. I lived in Soweto, the township that Nelson Mandela grew up in and, and, and lived in. Uh, he didn't grow up there, he lived there. And one of the things that I've have, have been such an impact to me is that as a child, I didn't think I'd end up here. I always thought we'd serve and we'd serve our country. And when 1994 came, when Nelson Mandela came out of jail, we thought it was all done. But then I felt even a little bit later from an ordinary family, from an ordinary childhood, that I had a word from God, and I felt to myself, look, I've got to go serve our country in whatever way I can. I started to equip myself, and now today I end up here leading the largest opposition in South Africa. We now govern in more cities than we ever have before. So that's Can you give God glory for that? That is amazing. So there was a person in your life that, that uh, said to you, um, I believe... God has his hand upon you. Was that a nun that, that spoke that word of encouragement yeah. to you? Tell us about her. Uh, I, in, in the Catholic um, school that I went to as a child, we had a Catholic nun. And that nun literally would, we'd spend afternoons with her all the time. And she was an incredible woman. She was an ANC activist, so she was in the party of Nelson Mandela, as most people were. And, and she often, I remember writing, she wrote a testimonial for me, as every principal has to for a child. And she wrote in there, my money has a critical mind. And I didn't know what the word critical meant. I thought, I only heard the word critical as in hospital. So I thought she said I wasn't well. So, so I then got <laughs> genuine concerned, but it was through her in being able to conscientize us about A, that just by being black we weren't less than, and B, that we would be able to do whatever would be, we could purpose ourselves to do. So she was an incredible inspiration, and I really often want to pay tribute to her because often when I think about the fact that now we govern Joburg, the city that I grew up in, mm -hmm. is such an exciting thing. And I've also had words later on by people like Pastor Russell and many others who've spoken words in my life that have brought us to this point that we're at today. That's so awesome. Don't forget those people that God uses in your life to speak destiny over you. There are many times not the ones in the spotlight, but they're the ones that had that word of encouragement and what a blessing that she was. What is your vision for the future of South Africa? And I think I asked you earlier, is it important that the hand of God remain on you and that we continue to pray for you to have godly wisdom? 
Absolutely. I, 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 think, I think nations are birthed in heaven. I, don't, I, I, I think there's something that transitions and that can impact society. And I hold the true vision that says that South Africa's economy can turn to a prosperous nation. I hold the absolute vision that says that we can produce young people who can compete with anybody else in the world. I hold the absolute vision that says that South Africa does not have to be a place of crime, but that people can live safe and stable. I believe that there can be health care that builds healthy citizens. So I, don't, I wake up every day believing God for a prosperous, non-racial society. Thank you for saying yes, Musi. And we're going to continue to pray for him, aren't we? Good things, great things ahead for this man of God. Amen. Pastor Sammy Rodriguez, I said if you look at his Instagram, he's everywhere. I mean, he's in this country, that country. Where have you been over the last month? Ukraine, um, Singapore, and now here in Australia. That's awesome. You said yes long ago. How old were you? Tell us your story. I was... 14 years old and then subsequently 20. 14 years old in an Assembly of God church. Uh, my parents are not pastors or preachers. Uh, I was a math nerd and I was obsessed with mathematics which is the language of God, it still is. <laughs> because it's pure. 2 plus 2 is 4 and there's no debate Spanish about it. Spanish was whatsoever. the language of God. Spanish is the second language okay, of God. All right. <laughs> which makes God bilingual now. <laughs> So I, I, this Teen Challenge director came into our Assembly of God Church in Pennsylvania and called me out of the crowd. So I believe in the gifts of the Spirit because I experienced it and called me out by my first name. And there was a person there who bore witness to this who happens to be in the audience who just fell head over heels in love with me. She's now my wife. So she's in the audience now. And Yay, she's in the audience. I can't wait to meet her. I've so, heard so much about her. At the age of 20, but even though I, I got that word, and the word in parenthetically was, listen, you're going to reconcile Billy Graham's message with Dr. King's march. You're going to reconcile righteousness with justice. Because America was so split yeah. between the followers of Billy Graham and the followers of Dr. King, between the vertical and horizontal people, between righteousness and justice. So this mandate to reconcile Billy Graham with Dr. King, when I was 20 years old, I was still studying computer science engineering at Penn State University. That's when I said yes. When God said, you like your computer engineering science degree, you want to work for IBM at that time. And he said, are you willing to sacrifice it? Well, are you willing to say yes? And are you really willing to believe me for what I told you when you were 14? And I said yes, and here we are today. Awesome. Don't you love these yes stories? Take a minute, if you would, Sammy, and speak to our audience at home that are watching from around the world, and also, of course, to the people that are here in the auditorium, to why they need to say yes. D it is this clarion call. We all have a purpose. We're not here by coincidence. Every single one of us is on earth, alive, breathing today on purpose. There is a divine calling, a 1 Corinthians 2.9, a Jeremiah 29.11, a great purpose for each and every one of us. But it requires us. God is never going to impose that mandate, that assignment, that calling. It requires us to say yes. Now, yes, regardless of how you are, you may be broken, you may have some dirt on you, you may not be perfect. Say yes. Say yes. Believe God that his destiny will come to pass. Each and every one of us have a purpose, that God-given 1 Corinthians 7, 17 assignment, and what God has placed in us is always greater than anything hell can place in front of us. That's a good word. That's a good word. Rachel, Michelle, usually we have women at the table, so I only have one with me. We have all the men today, which is awesome. But uh, quickly, your little quick yes story of uh, you didn't really believe you'd be helping mom and dad at Daystar. In fact, she told me she was not going to do that. Don't ever say no, right? So anyway, quickly, in a nutshell, may take a, one minute. Yeah, you know, I was raised in a Christian home and knew God my entire life, but I think that I had to know him for myself. I had to have a faith outside of my parents' faith, and so I think I kind of went on a journey, and um, it wasn't until I experienced a love that didn't make sense that turned my life around. You know, so many times you want to tell people about God, but I think it's when we show people the love of God through how we treat people and how we love people that people's lives are turned around, and, and that's my story. And you said yes. I said yes. I'm glad she said yes. She's here <laughs> sitting beside me today. Pastor Neil, you said yes. I did. Tell us about it. 
Well, in relation to uh, Papua New Guinea, I mean, I've said yes my whole life, I think. But in recent times, we uh, had the incredible privilege, Russell and I were just talking, and we were talking about mission and how there'd been so much done in mission. But really, a nation had never been taken. A, ne a nation had never been won. And we started to dream, how could that be? And uh, some guys inspired us from One Nation One Day about discipling nations. And, uh, and so for that, we, we started to talk about it. And we felt with privilege comes responsibility. Planet Shakes had incredible privilege all over the earth, plays on stages. And we thought, we need to give something back. And so with that, I... I um, I, I got the mandate of discipling nations. And at the start, it was, let's disciple nations. So as soon as you hear that, you go, well, God, what do I do? And uh, so I said yes, and I wrote a letter to the prime minister of the nation, not sure what, what, what would happen, but because I said yes and I wrote that letter, that's opened the door for where we are today. Did you ever expect to hear back? From that letter. No, not at all. In fact, when I heard back, I suddenly then thought, man, I have no qualification. I have no formal qualification, um, and I have nothing to say. And of course, that's when I really asked the Lord, what do we do next? And so was a meeting set up for you to meet the prime minister? Meeting was set up, and, um, and really, the, to be honest, the first thing that happened when I got the letter was fear setting, because I was like, what do I do now? What do I even say? <laughs> You know, it's great, let's take a nation, but what do I say to the leader? <laughs> and, uh, and really we set the meeting up and uh, it, it, it was really a word from God that gave me the confidence of what I would say and speak with the leader. So as a result of that meeting, then God gave you favor and Planet Shakers joined with Papua New Guinea to make a difference. Tell us about some of the things that happened. Well, the, the download that God gave us was a word from the first Kings, actually. And it's, it's where Elijah gets the word, go and tell the king heavy rain is coming. And there's so much we can read in that. So that's what I went with. And he gave us five key principles that we would simply speak to the mindset of the nation, leadership. And it's a great privilege for us to have the Speaker of the House here today. And, uh, and he, he talked to us. Uh, then the next thing was that we would actually work with business. And so now there's incredible business opportunities that we're working with the government to open up. Then education. The education minister recently said to us that he would um, open every school in the nation. We could do whatever we wanted with the schools in the nation. Then health, we've had some incredible opportunities in health. And then the church, to get the church to become transformational in the nation. And that's what God said. And to be honest, here we are 18 months later, and that's what's happening. Incredible. Isn't that amazing? Is Can you imagine, Pastor Sammy, if every church in the world would pick a nation? Totally. to partner with, to make a difference, just like Planet Shakers has done with Papua New Guinea. We could change the world, couldn't we? It's amazing. And that's what we, we are Planet Shakers here, aren't we? And we are yeah. world changers, and that's why you're here. Introduce uh, Speaker of the House from Papua New Guinea, Speaker Theo, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. This is really awesome what's going on. Tell us... Um, a little bit of your story, because you said yes in some very difficult situations because you cared more about what God thought than what people thought. And that's an important lesson we all can learn. Tell us your story. Yeah, well, Johnny, I went into politics in 2007. And that was after I had a conviction in my heart that, that the Lord was calling me to go into politics. You know, initially I thought politics was a dirty man's business. And that was how we perceive it in, in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, but then I had an encounter in which the Lord told me, um, just as Moses was, he was not only a spiritual leader, but he really was a political leader. He was uh, striving for the destiny of uh, his people, the people of Israel. Likewise, he said, you could go and make politics become a holy profession. And, wow. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, and so I began my process of entering into politics, and I stood for the first time and won on, on the first attempt. In Papua New Guinea, you hardly get into 
uh, parliament the first time, you have to go a number of times before you are elected. I simply got on the first time, so I realized it was the Lord leading me all the, all the way through. Yeah. Yeah, and because of the conviction, I did not join government. I entered as an independent candidate, won the election, and ended up in the opposition for four years. But all along, I, I have had encounters, supernatural encounters with the Lord, divine encounters, that confirmed that, that the Lord was leading me all along. Um, and it came to a point in, in, in the fourth year, before we, we go back to the elections, on the final year, um, we were able to change government in the vote of no confidence we took over. And I ended up becoming the Minister for Education. Uh, but, mm. Now, there's a, a particular story that you share about where you were in Parliament. And maybe explain a little about Papua New Guinea, I guess, is located in a part of the world, and I don't understand all of this, but where there are no earthquakes. Is that right? N not exactly. Okay. We, uh, <laughs> Explain it to me. <laughs> um, I would say um, Papua New Guinea actually lies along the ring of fire. Yeah. Um, but the capital city where the seat of uh, the parliament is, is located on the southernmost part of the country, where it, it is uh, it's away from the um, movements, you know. Oh, okay. Geogra yeah. All right, and so take us back to that day you were standing before Parliament. Well, um, it so happened that after we changed government, um, we were in a session in Parliament in grievance debate, and I had an opportunity to speak. Um, and because we, it was immediately after change of government, I expressed some sentiments in relation uh, to supporting the government for the change, you know. I said it was justified that the government was changed. And um, because of the past encounters and experiences that the Lord graciously allowed me to experience, I stated in the House of Parliament that the Parliament House was cursed and that we ought to pull the Parliament down and rebuild a new Parliament. Uh, it happened at the very instant I raised my voice, the parliament shook. There was a tremor that measured 7.3 on the Richter scale. Yeah. I mean, you and know, so, those, those. So did they, did they realize that it was almost like a, a, a spiritual connotation to it in that God was speaking to them collectively? Yeah, I was actually, you know, speaking from, from a spiritual perspective when I said the house was cursed. And I raised my voice and said, Prime Minister, we ought to pull this parliament down. It is cursed, it must be destroyed, and we ought to build a new parliament. And it happened at a very split second, the, the tremor struck. <laughs> wow. I love that boldness. How many of you are gonna have that boldness for this season that we're living in today? God's gonna give you opportunities like that. Pastor Neil, give us your take on all of that, because I know you know the story and sure. maybe have some insight as well. Sure. Well, well, that very thing that happened is, uh, you know, interesting because, uh, number one, when Pastor Russell was born, which he was born in Papua New Guinea, there was an earthquake took place. Um, and then on top of that, uh, when we were there, Planet Shakers, on the 26th of uh, August last year, again, we're talking about Port Moresby where it's not on a plate line, at the end of the night, there was an earthquake in the city again. And, uh, you know, you can over-spiritualize things, but there's a sense of, wow, God is wanting to make a statement that he is there. And with uh, Theo, the, it, it's for us sometimes contextually, for him to speak in Parliament on public record and say those things, bearing in mind that as the Speaker, his office is to protect the House there's a lot that's embodied in that statement. And so his boldness, I mean, for me, I wanted to meet him when I heard some of these stories and I agitated through a number of people because I was like, this is like a prophet of old. I want to meet this man. It's and like Elijah know, standing there, repent. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, today he's talking, but he, 
if you didn't pick it up, he can crank it up. And I love when he cranks it up and, you know. I love that. So as it relates to the Word of God, is there a place for the Word of God in Papua New Guinea and in the government? Yeah, well, Johnny, you, you know, we, we come from a background of uh, 850 different languages and a thousand tribes. And that is uh, in a land of about um, just over 400,000 square kilometers uh, of area. But the diversity is immense. So you would say you have a thousand different cultures all thriving together. It was not easy for our founding fathers to unite our country and make it become one nation. You're talking about thousand nations in one island. And um, the biggest hurdle to get the country united was uh, to unite the nation, to get to, to, to establish the country was to actually unite the nation. That was the biggest uh, challenge that the founding fathers had. Um, we realized going forward, the only thing that would truly unite our country is to ensure our country is founded on the, on the infallible word of the Lord. Mm. Amen. Beautiful. Mm. Powerful. What about that story? I absolutely love it. It's powerful, it's prophetic, but it, it doesn't have to stop in New Guinea. It can happen around the world. But he mentioned the idea of how can we unite a nation? And I don't want to be, I'm not a naysayer, as you will know. I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm prophetic. But a divided church will never heal a broken nation. A divided church cannot unite a nation. So before we disciple a nation, we have to bring the church together. In the name of Jesus, let this be the generation that brings the church together, that does away with every wall of division and fragmentation and this stream and that stream. There's only one river. It's the river of the Holy Spirit. It's the river of Jesus. And we need to come together in order to disciple nations. That's my sermon. I'm done. Praise the Lord. All of you guys at this table and lady, you all have all accomplished amazing things for Christ and you guys are changing nations. But for me and for so many of you guys watching on Daystar and for everybody out in the audience, all the young Young people, people that are dreamers, they have a dream, they have a call, but maybe that's all that they have. They're at the beginning of their journey. What would you say to them? I, I think that in many ways that's more than enough because you've got to just be willing to be obedient and get in it. You know, I, I, I've often felt that even often going into politics or going into any other core, I walked in there, studied, you start to equip yourself. And it, I'm not insecure about my own faith. I'm not insecure about the word that God has given me, that every time I speak, I must brand everything and say, Jesus, this, jet. No, 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 I'm not even nervous about that. I'm quite secure in my own self to know that if God has called me, he's able to yes. do it. Right. And you can walk in. So I never preach in parliament. I never feel like I've got to be in parliament and be like, I've got to preach. I just know that even though when I stand there, I represent him and he is able to do what he needs to do. So that's something more. Yeah. So you have a dream and a calling. I'm 14 years old. My wife is here. The guy prophesied. Now, again, I, I doubt it. I'm going to be honest. I mean, I was a math guy, so I was an evangelical agnostic, right? I doubted that. He said, you're going to speak to presidents. God says, I'm going to make you an advisor to presidents. I'm 14 years of age. What president? You know, I'm a Latino kid in Pennsylvania. What am I connected to politically? Nada. <laughs> so when I first got the call from the Bush administration, and I, and I had a steak dinner with a guy named Carl Rove one day in Sacramento, I asked Carl, why did you guys first invite me in the first place? And he looked at me, it's just him and I. He looked at me and said, I don't know. <laughs> one day, your number showed up on my desk, and I called. And here you are. So, I mean, so if you have a dream and a calling, don't yeah. try to push doors open. Don't try to force it. If, if, you, if you live a holy, healed, healthy, happy, humble life, God will open the door, and he'll take you there. Yeah. 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 That's so good. That's good. I love it. Don't you love hearing these testimonies? Aren't they inspiring? We are out of time. I want to thank my guests for joining me at the table today. Did you enjoy hearing from all of them? All right. Well, I wonder if we could do something just a little bit different. I wonder if we could just all stand in the building, and I'm going to ask those of you to stand. Those of you that are at home, I want you just to stretch your hand 
towards your TV or what, however you're watching Daystar because I believe this is a very important moment. It's a divine moment. And I, we're going to pray for not only those of you watching by television, but those of you that are here in the audience. You know, I love that we raise our hands because it's like we're saying, I surrender everything. And so many of you, God has a great destiny for you, just like the men that are seated at the table. So I want you to just lift your hands up and say, yes, yes, Lord. Yes. And Sammy, I'm going to ask you if you would just to pray. We've got about two minutes left and I want you to pray not only for those that are here in the arena, but for all of those that are watching from around the world, those in Africa and Brazil and Argentina and Canada and just all over the world, encourage them today in Jesus' name. Father, today with our hands raised, here in this place and around the world, even those, those right now viewing on Daystar, we are collectively saying yes. Lord, we acknowledge the fact that we live in dark times. The world is broken. The world is hurting. There is a vociferous call for help coming from every corner of the earth today. We turn on the television and we see children dying from chemical gas attacks. We see nations broken by racism and political strife. We see so much angst, so much suffering, so much pain. What is your answer? Your answer is in the people right now in this arena and around the world who have their hands raised and are saying yes. We are the answer. We are the Genesis 1-3 response to a Genesis 1-2 moment. There is darkness upon the face of the earth, but you said in Genesis 1-3, let there be light, and today we raise our hands, and we are the light. So we say yes to your call, yes to your grace, yes to your truth, yes to your word, yes to your mandate, yes to quenching the thirsty and feeding the hungry and welcoming the stranger, yes to doing justice, yes to walking humbly and and just doing your will, yes to fulfilling the Great Commission. We say yes, God. We say yes. Everybody raise your hands. When I say three, I want you to shout yes. Ready? One, two, three. Say yes. Say yes. Here we are, Lord. We say yes. We will change the world. We will shake the planet for the glory of Jesus. We will see an awakening amongst the nations like the world has never seen before. Planet shakers, we say yes. Thank you so much for watching this session. I, I really would pray and hope that God has spoken to you through it. Uh, you can continue to watch the rest of the session on daystar.com forward slash planetshakers to catch up with the rest of the session. Or if you'd like, if you'd like for someone to pray with you, you can send me log on to daystar.com forward slash prayer. See you soon.